So back in July of 2013, back when my outlook was almost completely different, I thought I'd try my hand at reviewing some games. I decided to take a look at a series of games that were close, special, and personal to me, the Crash Bandicoot series. This series was all over the place, it had some fantastic entries and some major stinkers as well. I had tons of fun reviewing all those Crash games, you can also tell that my outlook changed pretty quickly once I started those reviews. At first, I was a Let's Play channel. I played random games with my friends, and I really didn't have a strong following. I had only about 300 subs or so, in a year. I mean more than that in the last couple of months, but I digress. Reviews are something that would be just a little extra thing on the side, not something that I would do regularly. However, when I put out that first review of Crash 1, I was really proud of it. Now, I wasn't very good at reviewing at the time, but I had potential, and over time I got much better at it. Now, it's all I do. Because my old reviews were so-so in quality, the reaction was pretty mixed. Simply put, my old reviews weren't that great. I skipped over shit, I contradicted myself half the time, I stole jokes from other YouTubers and thought that nobody would notice, my microphone was just... it just sounded horrendous, and what the fuck was with the rating system? Out of seven? What was I thinking? I don't think rating games at all is good, but if I really had to, I could have done it out of five or ten, but seven? That's such a... I don't... I don't even know. After I finished the crash reviews, I decided to go on hiatus from reviewing games, give myself some time to cool down, look at what was wrong with the old reviews, and how I could improve. Recently, I made a comeback by reviewing the first three games of the Spyro series. Spyro 1 and 2 are my favorite games of all time, so I had a lot to say. Spyro 3, not so much, but I still had a lot to say about it. I have improved so much, but those old shitty reviews are still getting watched. I always wanted to revisit one, but I was never sure which. Although after getting comments on my Wrath of Cortex review, all giving me the same excuses for defending the game, and tons of wondrous and kind-hearted criticism, I knew that I just had to revisit the Wrath of Cortex. Which is what I'm gonna do. Right now. Let's start this shit! I am the Stimbyland, traveling into parts unknown. Now come with me, join me on my journey to do... THINGS! Away! I go! I'm not gonna bother with any dazzling intro montages, I'm just gonna jump right into this. Now, I need to step back and explain a few things. In order to understand this video, you have to know where I was coming from at the time. At the time of making that Wrath review, I had figured, hey, everyone hates the Wrath of Cortex. I thought that Wrath of Cortex was just a unanimously hated game, like Bubsy 3D or Sonic 06. I didn't put much effort into that review because I didn't think anyone would care, since everyone hated on the Wrath of Cortex, or so I thought. As it turns out, I made a pretty bad judgement call. I was surprised to see how many people actually liked the Wrath of Cortex, and when these people saw a video that basically shat all over the game and never gave it a serious look, it pissed them off, a lot. I can probably tell you that a majority of negative comments on my channel can be attributed to this review alone. You can tell that I really didn't take this review seriously. On more than one occasion I just called out my friends in the middle of the video, I screwed up on a lot of shit, and that microphone. You can very easily get hit by something you would not have time to react to. Ew. I thought my first review was unfair, and that I was basically just making a whole joke of the game. Also, the review was fucking crap. This time, it will be different. I'm not going to be making a serious, in-depth analysis of the game. No bullshit, no jokes, no bias. Honest, in-depth, serious analysis. This review is probably going to be a lot less humor-filled and a lot more informative. I'll be dissecting this game level by level and proving to you that this game is simply put, bad. I'll be backing everything up with legitimate reasons, and evidence will be shown from the game. This review will be more detailed than any of my other reviews, and probably the most detailed review of this game you can find. I will be going in full detail on almost every level. This also means that the video will probably be very long, and a lot of questions will be answered, so I encourage you to WAIT UNTIL THE END BEFORE LEAVING A COMMENT! If you have a question, it is likely I will answer it. If you leave a comment asking a question that was already answered in the video, I'm just gonna tell you to go home and die. First off, we're gonna refute some common arguments against my old review. I loved this game as a kid. Yeah, because that's totally relevant. I'm not going to be judging on nostalgia at all. Nostalgia is an unfair criticism as it caters specifically to you. Saying you enjoyed it as a kid really doesn't mean shit. Let me tell you something right now, and this is probably gonna surprise you, hell I doubt half of you will even believe me when I say it, but Wrath of Cortex was one of the first video games I ever played. 
In fact, Red of Cortex was not only the first Crash game I ever played, and the first platformer I ever played, but also the first game I ever played on a console before, and of all consoles, my absolute favorite, the PS2. Oh, and for those who are curious, the first game that I ever, ever played was Freddy Fish in the Case of the Stolen Conch Shell. You're welcome. Guys, I loved Wrath of Cortex as a kid. When I was little, Wrath of Cortex was the coolest thing in the world to me. But here's the problem. I was a kid, and kids are pretty easy to impress. Keep in mind, kids can't do shit about a game. They don't have years of knowledge and gaming experience under their belt because they're just stupid little fucking kids. They can't step back and give a game a serious analysis because they're just kids. If you show any regular person Sonic 06, they will most likely hate it. There are the glitches, the awful story, the weird graphics, just, you know, not very good game. But if you show Sonic 06 to a fucking stupid little kid, it's the coolest thing in the world to them. A kid doesn't see the weird story, graphics, or glitches. All they see is, whoa, look at how fast he goes. He goes round and round and round in the loop and he hits the guys and they go, boom, OMG, look at how cool that is. Oh my God, there's all this stuff and he goes, whoa, whoa, look at that, that looks so cool. If you show a kid a game, any game, it is the coolest thing in the world to them, even if the game is total trash. I adored Wrath of Cortex as a kid because I was a kid. I really didn't know any better. As I got better, I was able to step back and look at the game as a whole, and the fact of the matter is, it's not very good. Yes, I have nostalgia for Wrath of Cortex, but I can put nostalgia aside and give it an unbiased look. I therefore expect you to do the same. So, I grew up with this game is an invalid argument. If you go and tell me in the comments that you didn't see anything wrong with it when you were a kid, I'm just gonna tell you to go home and die. And I'm gonna block you, and I'm not even gonna think twice about it, because you are a total idiot if you write that. And don't write it in there as a joke either, because that makes you just as bad. Like, seriously. I'm Like, even if you write that it's a joke in the comment, just don't say that. That is stupid beyond belief. I'm being too critical. I don't think it gets much stupider than this. Okay, just sit back and watch for a second. Hey, bad man! What the fuck is wrong with you? Kingdom Hearts story is great. Sure, it's not well written, and the voice acting is bad, and the lip flaps look terrible, and the cutscenes make me want to kill myself, but the story is still good. Why should I let some little bitch like you judge what I play? Fuck you. Do you see how stupid that sounds? By the way, I was actually kidding in that segment. Batman is a cool guy, and you can check out more of his shady shit by clicking on his crotch. I'm gonna criticize this game left and right, and there's nothing you can do about it. Alright, you little bitch? Yeah, I don't know what, what, like, what this is, but it's pretty stupid. Stop comparing it to the other Crash games. Uh, no. These comparisons between the games will be made. If you're going to put out a game that plays exactly like the older installments in the series, then it better be as good or better than them. The reason I don't constantly draw comparisons between Crash of the Titans and Crash Warped is because they are two completely different games. Yes, they may be a part of the same series, but in terms of their core gameplay, they are very, very different. Crash Bandicoot Warped is a linear 3D platformer, and Crash of the Titans is an open 3D beat-em-up. You can go off and compare them on overall quality if you really want, but you can't go comparing the gem-grabbing gameplay of Warped to the mutant controlling in Titans. Wrath of Cortex, however, plays exactly as you would expect Warp to. No, 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 I'm sorry. Correction there. Wrath of Cortex plays exactly as you would expect a broken copy of Warp to. These two games are very similar, the comparisons will be made, and you can't stop that. Now let's dive into the game. And again, I implore you, WAIT UNTIL THE END BEFORE LEAVING A COMMENT! Please. So immediately, the first thing we see after starting the game is a load screen. Get used to this. This game needs to load a lot. Now, this can vary between the multiple versions of the game, but on my copy, the average load time is 39 seconds. Don't you fucking jump into the comments and tell me how long your version loads, as it may not even matter. Again, WAIT UNTIL THE END BEFORE LEAVING A COMMENT! The load times on my copy of the game are roughly 40 seconds, although I've gotten comments of people telling me their copy runs shorter. Yeah, this is just lovely. The fact that this game was shat out onto so many consoles makes this a real hassle. Let me explain something to you. This game was released with 40 second load times, and that is a fucking problem. Oh, your version has better load times? Good for you! This game was released onto store shelves. This game passed the test stages, was approved, with 40 second load times. I can excuse long load times for games like GTA 5, because GTA 5 is fucking massive and looks beautiful, and is just a giant ass game, so obviously it needs to load. Wrath of Cortex was a mediocre looking game being released on the powerhouse that is the PS2. Jack and Daxter, a game that looks better, released on the same console, has shorter load times. But again, I still hear you cry that you were not inconvenienced by this problem. Well, I was. 
Again, the game was released with 40 second load times. If Crash 2 was released with a game breaking bug, the game would have sucked. Maybe they came up with another version later that fixed the bug. Great. I don't care. I am judging the game on how it was released. Not the game's potential, but the finished product. Wrath of Cortex was released with 40 second load times and that is a major problem. Wait until the end before leaving a comment! The fact that I have to wait through 40 seconds of loading to start up a level is absurd. Oh, another 40 to start up the game. Crash Bandicoot is supposed to be something that you can pop in and play within a minute's notice, something nice and quick. When I was little, I would play games on my PS2 before I had to go to school. I would choose games like CTR and Spyro because it was nice and quick. I could boot up the console and within a minute I was racing on Crash Cove. Wrath of Cortex is something I had to prepare, and that is a fucking problem. Oh shit, I picked the wrong track on CTR? No big deal, only take about 20 seconds to start up another one. I pick a wrong level on the Wrath of Cortex? I have to wait through over a minute and a half of loading! Once to load the accidental level, once to load the warp room, and another to load the actual level I want to go to. Again, however, I implore you to WAIT UNTIL THE END BEFORE LEAVING A COMMENT! So anyway, the game finally starts up after 30 goddamn hours of loading, and we see the first cutscene, and... Oh... boy. It, it's... pretty ugly. These graphics are... terrible. I mean, we start up with the opening cutscene, and you know what? It Okay, this isn't looking so bad at first, but then the game just goes, fuck it. Right there. It just stops trying, and then this image is thrown at us. Don't f***ing kill that thing! You're aim for the head! It's f***ing huge! You can't miss it! Ah! That is one undead being! Ah! How long has that thing been alive, and how do I seal it back up in the f***ing... Crypt it came from oh my god, what is with these character models? Is this serious? This looks fucking horrendous. None of the textures look detailed at all and just Jesus just look at it Okay, wait a minute. Let's give the ps2 version a break. It's an early ps2 game A lot of those look really weird, but what about the Xbox version that everyone brags about? The same Xbox version with better graphics and reduced load times? Yeah, you heard right better graphics somebody put quotes around that the Xbox version, in addition to reducing the load times, adds fur to the bandicoots. That's it! Oh! Oh, great! So instead of hilariously ugly models, the bandicoots now look like creepy dolls! Great! How is this better? The Xbox version is considered the best looking version of this game, and if that is the case, then I am not impressed. And what is the release date of the best looking version of Wrath of Cortex? Oh, after Jack and Daxter? Yeah, Jack and Daxter looks great, plays great, and loads great. The Wrath of Cortex looks shit, plays shit, and loads shit. And you know, I can hear you all screaming over there, okay? I'm not deaf. I know you are saying, THIS GAME IS NOT UGLY! Now, I would disagree, but that's okay. I want you all to listen closely here, and this is important. This is the point that so many of you overlooked in my old review of this game, and the point that I didn't stress enough. Let's assume that Wrath of Cortex loads quick. Really quick. Faster than you can say, Oh man, I shot Marvin in the face. Why the fuck did you do that? Let's also assume Wrath of Cortex is a good looking game, a great looking game. Let's pretend that Wrath of Cortex looks sexier than Jesse's hot landlord from Breaking Bad. Even if this was true, the game would still be trash. The complaints with Wrath of Cortex do not end at the loading times and graphics. Saying you have a version that improves on these doesn't mean shit because you still leave open the countless gameplay flaws. Now this will be the part where I dissect the game piece by piece. I'm going to be describing the flaws of this game in great detail. Sorry to all my newer viewers, but I will not be explaining the levels in great detail, as I will be assuming that anyone watching this is familiar with how these levels play and function. I'm also going to be talking about the game in its entirety. Not in any percent run, but a full-fledged 106% run of the game, getting every single last gem and relic. But not gold relics. Fuck that. So let's start off with the opening sequence. It looks terrible. Not important. Let's move on. So the story is, Uka Uka is getting the help of four elemental masks. The elemental masks are now free and are going about their daily lives and generally causing trouble. Aku Aku then tells us that we need to collect the crystals to return the masks to their hibernation states, and it takes five for each mask. So in that case, simple math would tell us that four times five equals... 25? Uh, am I, am I doing something wrong here? Already this game makes no fucking sense and I haven't even gotten to the first level. Oh, speaking of which... Arctic Antics. So here is level one. Arctic Antics. This this level looks an awful lot like another game I reviewed, but I'm not quite sure which one. So anyway, I finished the first level and I noticed a few problems. Level one has a death route, and it's pretty generic. 
First off, the music doesn't change with the death route. In the fast-paced, action-packed death routes of Crash 2, the music got fast, it got intense, it was all like, Yo, this ain't your regular level, bitch. Stop talking and start driving, bitch. Mm. The intense music helped make the death routes more intense than the rest of the level. The goal of the death routes was to add replay value. If you got lucky and visited a death route on your first try, it might have been difficult, because the death routes generally spike the difficulty, so you'd wander off. Later, when you got better at the game, you would come back to the death routes, and now it felt like a reasonable challenge. It encouraged players to backtrack. It connected the levels in a unique way and added more to the old levels. For players on a second run, they get access to secrets early. Backtracking was encouraged, but not required. This was so unique and it added so much to Crash 2. Wrath of Cortex's death routes, on the other hand, are really nothing to be afraid of. I shit you not when I say that Wrath of Cortex's idea of a death route is a regular level plus nitros. I mean, look, this is the first one and look at how many goddamn nitros there are. When have there ever been this many nitros in Crash 3 or 2? Oh, what, that one time at the end of Crash 2? You know, this isn't evident in just the death routes now that I really think about it. Wrath of Gordix's idea of making a level challenging is just by adding nitros. Crash 2 and 3 could still be challenging, but they didn't need to use half as many nitros. The nitros aren't even that hard to avoid, they just make the level tedious and boring. So seeing nitros flood the screen upon entering a new level isn't exciting or intimidating. It's just annoying. It also just looks lazy and sloppy. Crash 2 and 3 were so vibrant and colorful, the variety between enemies was a constant throughout the entire game. To quote Mr. Plinkett for a second, you don't really notice it, but your brain does. The variety between enemies is an example of attention to detail. Listen closely because I'm going to be using this phrase a lot. Now games don't need to pay attention to detail, but when they do it really helps. There's the core mechanics of the game, and then there's the little things. The core mechanics would be the controls of the game, you know, the basic A to B objectives and such. But no game is comprised of just core mechanics. They pay attention to the details. Crash 2, in terms of its core mechanics, is a game where you move from beginning to end. You collect items and break other stuff to get more items. It's basic. But then you add the extra stuff, the attention to detail, and Crash 2 is a bright, colorful game with distinct differences between the levels. Would Crash 2 be even half as memorable if it weren't for the penguins running around in the tundras, or the man-eating plants? How about a Crash sinks in the mud and slowly wades through it, the way the water in the sewers flashes violently when an eel electrocutes it? You don't really notice it when it's there, but rather when it's missing. When it's missing, it feels... it feels off. It's weird. Spyro 2 is an example of a game that pays a lot of attention to detail. Spyro 2 does everything to assist the player and make sure the game caters to them by giving them some of the tightest controls around, tons of new abilities for Spyro to use, and a whole lot of other shit I mentioned in my review of this game. Breath of Cortex, on the other hand, is a perfect example of a game that pays no attention to detail whatsoever. Do we need to make our levels bright and vibrant? No, we can just get away with making them brown and gray. Variety between enemies? No wait, we can just copy and paste the same henchmen everywhere. Secrets? What are those? Challenging platforming? Wait, we can just plop nitros everywhere! That'll be fun! Wrath of Cortex just feels so off. The lack of attention to detail really strips the game down. A lot of the levels look the same and it's very... generic. Yeah, generic. If the laziness isn't evident yet, then believe me, it will be. Well, that was level 1. And now we have 24 more. Yay. Now level 2 is a vehicle level, and I need to put a vehicle rant into this review, so this will be the place that I do it. Now, with the vehicles in minigames, in platformers, it's risky. Even some of the most skilled developers out there fall victim to trying to make minigames. If you land it just right like Spyro 2 or Crash 2 did, it can add a lot to the game. But you risk going overboard and ruining the game, like what happened to Spyro 3 in the case of all the stupid characters. So if incredibly skilled developers can fuck up easily, developers with little experience under their belt should be very cautious. Don't add too many vehicles, keep them to a minimum. With this in mind, how many different styles of gameplay do we get in Wrath of Cortex? Well, there's the plane, the rolling ball, the minecart, the jeep, swimming crash, the submarine. Coco Bandicoot, the other plane, Coco's bike, the helipack, the robot, Coco's surfboard, the other robot, the other other plane, the other fucking plane, this thing, and 16. 16 different vehicles. Okay, 5 was bad enough, but 16, I, I'm at a loss for words at this. This is laughably stupid. This can only spell disaster for the rest of the game.
Oh boy. Tornado Alley. So with level 2 we control a slow moving plane around while non-existent enemies try and fail to hurt us. The plane moves so slow. There should be a button or something to move faster, like you know, what about a boost or something? The plane is so damn slow! Also, let's talk about these enemies. They really don't pose a threat. At all. Their shooting attack barely does any damage and they die in about one hit. Although half the time they don't even shoot you, sometimes the enemies will just straight up kamikaze you and this does like 40 damage. I just think it's kind of weird that the enemies will just ram into you. Like, you seriously don't think that's out of place or anything? Well actually, this whole thing is kinda out of place since I didn't need to fly a plane! Bamboozled. Now we get a new vehicle, the rolling ball. Oh, what's... I don't even... great. <laughs> uh, okay, so now he gets to roll around in a ball. I have to give credit to the developers of this game. The ball's controls are impressive. And remember, impressive isn't synonymous with good. The ball controls realistically like an actual ball would roll around, so I'll admit it's impressive, but... Did it need to be realistic? Like... Why would this game ever try to be realistic? I'm a bandicoot with pants that collects apples called wumpa fruit, and my enemies include a blue kangaroo with a straitjacket and an evil scientist who randomly turned to yellow. Why would anything here be realistic? This isn't fucking Half-Life, it's Crash Bandicoot, so what is what is with this? The carts in CTR don't control like actual carts. The swimming in Spyro 2 doesn't feel like actual swimming. So why would you try and make this ball feel like an actual ball? The ball is slippery and awkward to control. You can't just hit a button and have the ball come to a stop or slow down. You have to constantly be moving. As you move, the ball begins to build up ridiculous speeds, which would be fun to use, but the levels aren't designed to compensate. I would love to power through these levels as fast as I could. That might actually be pretty fun. But since they shat nitros everywhere, you have to take your time. This is a good example of how this game pays no attention to detail at all. There's nothing fun or meaningful about slowly stepping around nitros, and if the game designers bothered to take a second to look or shit even test the damn game they were making, they would see the problem. When you have a character or a vehicle that builds up speed so quickly, you want nice wide open space to exercise that ability, but there aren't any areas like that. You have to slowly inch through each level and it becomes really, really tedious. You know what might have helped? Maybe like a button to slow down or something, like hit X to decelerate or something like that. You know. Paying attention to details, making the player's experience feel smooth and fluent rather than stagnant and awkward, these are foreign concepts to this game. Next. Wizards and Lizards. In this level, we get chased by a spastic dinosaur and have to avoid more absurd amounts of nitros. <laughs> so this is another one of Crash's levels. I don't really have too much to say on this level, so I guess I'll use it to discuss Crash's controls. Crash's controls... Okay, I said Crash controlled like crap in my old review, but I'll admit, his controls are passable, but having controls that are just passable in a series where tight controls are one of its strongest traits is... stupid. It's very easy to slip up on your jumps, slide jumping doesn't work properly, and then come the abilities. Oh boy, they are quite the mess. Oh, and speaking of abilities, Crash doesn't start out with any of his old abilities from Crash 3. You need to unlock them all again. Why do I have to re-unlock the abilities? You couldn't think of some new ones to give me? More on these abilities later, I don't want to spoil anything. Anyway, boring ass level. The dinosaur looks like it's having a seizure and it's hard to see what comes at you. Next. Compactor Reactor. Upon the opening of this level, we're introduced to another vehicle, the minecart. The minecart rides along these tracks and it is heavily automated. You can pretty much just choose which lane it goes down. You can tilt left and right to grab the boxes, but when doing this you still risk the possibility of hitting the 10,000 nitros. Even then though, it's still pretty easy. Some of the nitros are literally put in positions that are impossible for you to get to, aka to make the level more intimidating. I appreciate the effort, but we're still in the first warp room. Don't you think that this is a little extreme? The game should still be fairly light at this point, but no! I gotta watch it jerk itself off as I roll around in a stupid minecart. Minecarts. Wish I was, I wish I was playing Minecraft or anything else that's not this. Now the first boss. So the first boss is Crunch, and he is aided by an elemental mask, Rocco. We get to fight the first boss in a vehicle. A vehicle that we only used once and was fucking boring then and is fucking boring now. I guess we at least get to move really quickly with it now, but ugh. Just, the goal of this boss is to hit these rocks and turn them blue, then Crunch will get hurt. Do this three times and you win. Every time Crunch gets hurt, there's an extra rock you have to hit. Half of the damn battle relies on luck. The camera is not very reliable and it's very difficult to see where you're going. 
Maybe if this boss was done from a bird's eye view, it might have been not that bad, but it's just really awkward and slow. It doesn't even feel like a battle, it feels like a minigame. This is supposed to be one of the highlights of the game. The bosses are meant to spike the difficulty, preparing you for the upcoming warp room. It's supposed to test the skills you've learned so far. During the Ripto fight in Spyro 2, the orbs will give you power-ups that you got to use before in the game, like the fireball attack and the supercharge. Supercharge? Yes, I rolled around in a ball before, but when in the game did I ever have to collide with rocks in an arena, and when am I ever going to again? It's just weird and off and just... boring. The boss is just not that memorable at all. Oh, let's talk about that, by the way! The antagonists of this game, and how they are really not memorable and they really don't stand out a whole lot. Like Crash 3, you get talking head cutscenes, this time with the masks. All of the masks look similar and really don't have distinct personalities. Like, think of it this way, with Crash 3, we had a giant tiger named Tiny, a cross between a dingo and a crocodile, a blue guy who controlled time, and a guy who had a rocket in his head. What does Wrath of Cortex offer? A mask, a mask, a mask, and a mask! Oh wait, two more masks! Okay, maybe it's not all about appearances. Do they at least say any memorable things? Before the bosses showed up constantly, having them threaten you is supposed to make them intimidating. When you finally got up to them and saw them in person, or saw them in Bandicoot for the first time, it made them feel that much more intimidating and memorable. Remember, these guys threatened to kill you. Leave them for Tiny, or crash it, crash. So give me the goods and shove off, or I'll roast you. So how does Wrath of Cortex follow this up? Is there a draft in here? You know, I, I'm really shooting my pants, seriously. After we beat this boss, we get a new power an actually new power, called the Tiptoe, and it gives us the ability to walk on nitros. Okay, wait, when did I ever need or want the ability to walk on nitros? Nitros are the big bad no-no, so I should avoid them, but now with the Tiptoe I can walk on them. Actually, no, you can't jump onto a nitro crate and start tiptoeing on it because you'll just go <coughs> You can only walk on nitros in little set areas. Okay, listen, asshole. These are abilities, not gimmicks. Crash 3 incorporated the abilities into the game very well. When you got a new ability, the level started subtly adding areas that encourage you to use your abilities. You have the double jumps, so now the jumps are gonna get a little longer, and the gaps are gonna be a bit wider now. Oh, you have the hover spin, so okay, now gaps will be more common since you can safely land on platforms now. You have the bazooka? Okay, so now enemies are gonna be more common, there are gonna be more nitros and such, and we're gonna start hiding boxes from you. But it was subtle, it was attention to detail, something this game completely lacks. Again, Wrath of Cortex's idea of challenge is just shitting nitros everywhere. Okay, you unlock the double jump, so here's more nitros. You have the hover spin, so here's more nitros. You have the bazooka, okay, so here's more nitros. The only useful abilities in this game are the double jump and the super dash. The others are completely pointless. The tiptoe only gets used in specific areas of the game designed for it and has no secondary use. The hover spin takes time to register, and no parts of the game require you to use your hover spin to reach a faraway platform. The bazooka no longer fires at a point on screen, but rather at a point relative to your position. Aiming becomes a bitch, and it is often difficult to tell what you're actually going to hit with each shot. They paid no attention to the detail while making this game. Why is the hover spin here? Why is the bazooka here? They have no significant use. Oh, wait a minute. They were in the last game, so that means that they have to be here too. That makes fucking sense! I'm not even halfway done with this game, and I already want to shoot myself. Great. Jungle Rumble. We get another new vehicle here. Jesus fucking Christ. Now it's a car. Really not much to say. I don't have much to say because this level just looks ugly. Like, look at how muggy and gross it looks. It doesn't look bright and vibrant, but it doesn't look calm and peaceful either. It just looks... Ew. Look, I get that you guys might like vehicles, but you don't think that this is a little overkill? So far, of all the levels I've played, only one didn't have any vehicles, and that was the first level! Oh boy. The next level, it's, uh, it's something else. Alright, these next two levels are basically the same, so I'm gonna cover them both. Yes, it conflicts with the order, but I don't care. Pretty much everything I have to say on one counts for the other. Seashell Shenanigans and Coral Canyon. In these levels, we get to swim around, like in Crash 3, a game that this is already too similar to. Basically, imagine if Crash 3's swimming controls were even more slippery than before, there were mines all over the place, enemies flew out of nowhere, there were nitros everywhere, and they were ridiculously long. That is Wrath of Cortex's swimming levels. The swimming is bad enough, but then you get to control an underwater submarine. This is where the pain really begins. Oh boy, oh. This is the worst vehicle in a Crash game, or just fucking ever. 
This is horrible! This is literally the worst experience I've ever had with Crash Bandicoot. Moving around in this shitty sub. Oh, the fucking sub. Fuck, I hate it. It gives me PTSD just thinking about it. It is terrible. It is horrible. So if sliding around aimlessly and helplessly underwater wasn't that bad enough, now we get this. Where do I even begin? The sub is supposed to be empowering. It's supposed to be like... Don't go sneaking around the ocean floor unless you want to mess with me. But instead it feels more like... <laughs> The sub can pick up speed, but it turns very slowly. When the mine is falling over your head and you finally decide to turn back, it's usually too late. Even when you see it coming, you will still die. The sub is very slow to turn. Another big problem are enemies. They literally fly out of fucking nowhere. You will be slowly cruising along minding your own business when FUCK YOU THEN! The screen isn't zoomed out far enough. Oftentimes you're killed by shit that you wouldn't have had time to react to. But the most glaring and fucking ridiculous problems is the submarine's attacks. The submarine has two attacks, one being a torpedo that shoots straight in front of you and the other that drops a mine beneath you. You fire a torpedo in whatever direction you're facing, but your sub can face three directions. Upon moving left, it fires left, right, fires right, but whenever you move up or down, the sub centers itself, and you can't fire a torpedo in this state. Say you miss an enemy and then quickly move up to hit them. Your sub centers itself for no fucking reason, and you die. But most ridiculous of all, the torpedoes don't do jack fucking shit. The simple task of trying to shoot an enemy right in front of you becomes a chore, and this is no exaggeration. I will literally be firing 10 times in the same direction and still have an enemy fly back at me. The torpedoes stop to hit the Wumper Fruit in boxes, but enemies don't. Meaning if an enemy is charging at you and you go to shoot them, there might be a tiny little Wumper Fruit in the way. You will shoot your torpedo and nothing will happen. One Wumper Fruit will disappear and you'll be dead. But the enemies require such extreme accuracy to hit with the torpedoes. You'll literally be firing 5, 10, 15 times right in front of you, only to have an enemy fly right back in your face! Look at this fucking shit! How did I not kill him? How is this motherfucker not dead? Oh my god! This is literally unplayable! It is broken! Oh wait, wait, wait! Hold on! None of this really matters because the Xbox version reduces load times! You see how fucking stupid that sounds? Even your precious little Xbox version that makes the fucking bandicoots look like goddamn motherfucking dolls still suffers from this shit! I'm trying to be nice, but everyone who defended this game is a motherfucking piece of fucking shit. I take back what I said at the end of my old review. This isn't terrible. No, it is beyond terrible. It infuriates me to hear people describe this as not that bad, or 5 out of 7 in my eyes. Not bad? This is unplayable! This is literally broken! The most basic and simple of tasks are next to impossible in this fucking submarine. It's ridiculous and inexcusable, and I could really end the review here if I wanted to, but I'm not done yet. I'm gonna skip levels that I have no comments for, since a lot of them are the fucking same. Because, again, this is a generic piece of shit. Next level. Banzai Bonsai. Now we get to play as Coco, for the first time. Except in Crash 3. And CTR. Then Crash Bash! To be fair, this is Coco's first time platforming on foot in a traditional Crash game. No, no, I'm sorry, correction. A broken version of a traditional Crash game. Coco should have some new abilities, right? Well, she is literally fucking pointless, just like everything else in this game. She controls just like Crash, only she can't quite jump as high, and instead of sliding, she has to stop in place and do a pointless low kick. She's literally just a downgrade of Crash. Like, what the fuck was the point? Think about it, though. Someone actually spent their time designing Coco to play as a lesser version of Crash. And the game is advertised all like, Excuse me, sir, but I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. Is it trying to, like, appeal to feminists or something? Because if that's the case, then I think it's backfired. The message here is pretty sexist, because it's basically saying that women are just a downgraded version of men. No, really, like, what can Coco do that Crash can't? Oh, what? Have a slightly stronger body slam? Really? Well, Crash can double jump, walk on nitros for no reason, hover in the air, use a bazooka, and run really fast. But Coco has a super body slam. Totally pointless character. For fuck's sake, in CTR, Coco at least had different stats than Crash. Damn, this game really does suck. Ugh, like that wasn't obvious from the submarine rants. Hmm. That sinking feeling. Well, anyway, we have a plane again, and... Wait, nothing's happening. Wait, wait, why, why can't I hurt anyone? Why am I not firing shit? Seriously, I was so confused that I actually had to pause the game and open the manual to see the controls. This is more evidence for the fact that this game pays zero attention to detail. Seriously, how hard would it have been for this game to just have a little blip on the screen that says, This plane instead locks onto enemies. Lock on enemies by holding down the X button and release it to fire. 
Yes, I know the manual exists for a reason, but what if my game doesn't come with a manual? Having to check the manual for controls takes me away from the game, and if this game were any good, it would try hard to keep you engaged. The creators of Spyro 2 didn't want you getting distracted by what's going on in the other room while you're playing the game. The game is supposed to keep you hooked, attached to the screen, enveloped in the world it had created, and almost have you feel like you were really there. Having to pause the game to check the manual for instructions removes so much from the experience. Again, a little blip on the screen could have solved this. So where was it? Up their ass, that's where. This game shows a complete lack of attention to detail. It does nothing to help the player, and it does nothing to keep them hooked. It just sucks. H2 oh no. You know what? This level... It ain't so bad, you know? I mean, I like some of the set pieces, you know, it's nice. This game hardly has any interesting set pieces, so when they show up, it's pretty and Oh, what the fuck? Tsunami. So we're playing this Coco again, and everything is going as dreadful as usual until we eventually come to this point. There's a scooter, so I start moving on it, and I die. I'm moving too slow, the wave catches up, and I die. Okay, fine. So I go again, and I hold down X to accelerate. Only makes sense, right? The Jeep moves forward with X, so I think I'd be correct to assume that pressing X makes me accelerate, but... Nope. I just jump. Okay, so what the fuck do I press? This is the second time I find myself returning to the manual. Oh, okay, apparently I had to hit circle, because that was obvious. Again, a little blip on the screen. Press circle to ride the scooter. Th that's all I would have taken! I can do it with YouTube annotation, so I can an entire development team do it for this one game. It just goes to show you how goddamn lazy they were. They didn't give a shit about the player. Nope, they can just look at the manual and fuck them if they get upset about it. Smokey and the Bandicoot. This time we have a race, in the Jeep from before. We have a race and we have to race four bulky vehicles in a very tight and closed track. With Crash 3's motorcycle stages, the enemies were very spaced out. Your motorcycle was small and could navigate easily around them. But in this case, a race has instead turned to a match of bumper cars. It's hilariously awful, and it again shows no attention to detail. If they bothered to test this fucking game, they would realize how stupid this is, but they clearly didn't. Then there's the gem of this level. Oh boy, it is a nightmare. Don't even try to get the gem and win in first place. The best way to go about it is to slowly inch into each box, and this then just makes the level a fucking chore. I'm not even gonna ask, what were they thinking? But rather, were they even thinking at all? W was this even tested? Fahrenheit Frenzy. We get another vehicle. This time, a helipack, which is just a carbon copy of Crash 2's jetpack. I'm sorry, a broken version of Crash 2's jetpack. So after the very exciting helipack segment, we're dropped into a regular level. What I'm beginning to realize is that these levels are getting way too long. Some of these levels are minutes long. I mean, like, for fuck's sake, just end already. Crash is supposed to be quick and simple, pick up and play, a childhood game to play before school. Even if you have the super enhanced Xbox version that reduces the load times ever so slightly, you still come across another problem. The levels are too damn long. Avalanche. So, uh, how do I move this snowboard? Is it circle? Oh, okay, it's, it's circle. You know, the hint would have helped that. Droid Void. So the level opens and we have bars to climb on. Shouldn't be a problem. You can climb around all the time in Crash 2, so let's go. <laughs> Damn, this is taking longer than I thought it would. Okay, can we like speed this up, please? Oh my god! Oh my god, look at how long this takes! Why is climbing so slow? Seriously, it shouldn't take me a whole minute to get to the first checkpoint. Look at how long this takes! We also get another vehicle and okay, stop. What am I playing right now? Is this even a Crash Bandicoot game? What is this? So now we get to control a robot, which is like every other vehicle in this game. Absolutely pointless, and only serves to overly complicate the most basic tasks. Yay. The robot doesn't attack by spinning or punching in front of it, or... spraying, but instead uses a gun that shoots Wampa Fruit. This would be fun if it was executed properly, but... no, oh, come on. Nothing in this game was executed properly. You know this by now, and I'm, I'm just wasting your time with this. Fuck. The gun is next to impossible to aim, as you can obviously imagine. It doesn't aim at a target on the screen, but instead to a point relative to your position. Aiming is a bitch. Your target isn't displayed on the screen, but instead bouncing off the surface you are aiming at. It's difficult to see where you're firing. Lining up your shots is a bitch. And oh my god, weren't there already enough vehicles in this game? This is rape. This is rape. Shrek is love. Shrek is life. Hey, speaking of bullshit, they also managed to overcomplicate another basic task. Jumping. While running in the robot, you jump and everything is normal, but when standing still, Crash has to come to a complete stop for some reason. 
Not like this jump is high or anything, it's just overly complicated and pointless like everything else in this game. I know what I'm saying sounds like nitpicks, but really think about it for a second. A developer should do all they can to make the experience as smooth and fluent for the player as possible. Why would you implement features that stifle your speed? It makes no sense at all. Why would Coco completely stop in place? Why can't she just slide? Why does the droid stop in place before jumping, but only when it's standing still? It makes no sense! Crash droids. In this level, we fly around as Coco in a ship. Yep, it's another glorious flying level. The objective is again unclear, as I checked the manual for a solution and it didn't have one. What you're supposed to do is destroy these things guarding the towers and then destroy the towers themselves. Again, a little blip on the screen could fix this. I think Aku Aku like, said something in the beginning, but I couldn't hear him. What did he say? A little blip on the screen! That could have fixed this! Minimal effort required! Why not? Because fuck you. That's why. We're Traveler's Tales Knots for it, and we don't give a single fuck. Weathering Heights. <laughs> Gold Rush. Everything seems normal here. Oh, oh, god damn it, god damn it, more of this shit! Alright guys, you like your vehicles, I get it, but you don't think that this was a little overboard? Not like it can get much worse than... Fuck it. No, no, fuck it, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done. I don't care anymore. At all. I am completely uninterested in this game. It is terrible in every sense of the word. So a few more levels to address, and then we're gonna be on unpacking. Goodbye, Wrath of Cortex. I won't miss you, you motherfucker. Goodbye, you piece of Relics. This game sees the return of relics, and I already thought that they were out of place and warped, but here, they are a nightmare. In relic challenges, you have to race to the end as fast as possible, but levels aren't designed to compensate. Levels contain tight spaces, lots of enemies, obstacles that act like walls, and many other obstructions. Oh, and the Nitro Spam doesn't help at all. The levels are so long, I mean for fuck's sake guys, they're called time trials, right? Not time marathons, time trials. It's supposed to be quick, you are literally racing against time. But guess what, every level has a relic, including Coral Canyon, Medieval Mayhem, I'ma get medieval on your ass. Gold Rush, Droid Void, it is a nightmare. The relics contribute to unlocking levels in the hidden sixth warp room. Now let's have a quick look at that shit. Nightlight. Hey look! It's level 11, only we play as Coco and it's dark. Now it's top quality. Now for the last level I'm gonna cover, level 27, Ghost Town. This level is atrocious. This is guilty of the most inexcusable sin here. Well, okay, except for the sub. Nothing is worse than the sub. Ghost Town is a level that exists entirely in the minecart. You get to race crunch round. It's not that difficult. Okay, just, just watch this for a second. I give you Ghost Town, accompanied by the fine musical genius of Los Cuates de Sinaloa. Enjoy. So, did you spot the atrocity? Well, I hope you're ready, because here it is. I didn't press a single button on my controller. I actually got rewarded for doing nothing. How lazy were they? They didn't once think to check and see, oh shit, maybe the game might suck dick if we don't stop smoking all this weed. Better go back and fix the damn game. This didn't once go through their heads. No way, it's okay, because the Xbox version reduces load times, guys. It's okay. To any of you who actually want to tell me that your fucking butt ugly Xbox version redeems this game, I have one thing to say to you. That's great. That's great. So, that was Wrath of Cortex. It was pretty horrendous. Yes, I know you all love your Xbox version so much, but guess what? 
Even if your version managed to fix one problem or two, you still leave open the other 99. To hear people describe this game as not bad is absurd. What? The fact that I prefer Bash to this is mind-numbingly stupid? No, asshole! Bash is fucking functional. I can start up the game and expect it to run as advertised. That is not something I can say for Wrath of Cortex. It does nothing to add to what its predecessor spent so much time building up. It completely ignores the improvements and details of its predecessors, and does absolutely nothing to help the player at all. It does nothing to show any extra attention to detail. Even when its predecessors are taken out of the equation, it's just not a very competent platformer at all. The bosses aren't memorable, the vehicles are a fucking nightmare, the glitches are pervasive and common, it overcomplicates the most basic of tasks, and it has no redeemable qualities whatsoever! I take back what I said at the end of my old review. This game isn't terrible. No, it's fucking worse. Saying this game is terrible is an insult to actually terrible games. This can't even be called a game. It is a broken, sloppy, rushed, shitty fucking mess, and you should avoid it at all costs. Sure, I guess you could really dig deeper if you wanted to, but... Why would you settle for this? There's so many games out there that are better. There are plenty of fun and unique platforms out there that greatly surpass this shit. Like Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, Ratchet and Clank 3, Up Your Arsenal, or Gubble. Fucking Gubble. Or anything that's not this crap! Seriously though, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next week when I review a surprise game. Uh, I was gonna review Ratchet or Jack next week, but I can't do either. I can't do either because I don't have PS3 component cables for Ratchet HD, and I thought that I owned Jack HD, but apparently the only other Jack game I own aside from Jack 1 is uh, something called Jack X Combat Racing, so uh, no thanks, putting a pin in that plan for now. So the next game, I'm going to review a surprise game next week. It'll be a surprise trilogy. Ooh. Well, kind of. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next week. Oh, wait. Go click this crotch right here, cratch, to go watch a uh, Bad Man's Reviewist. Or you could check out uh, my friend Pat and Sam in this box right here when they played, uh, I don't even know what, I'll just put up one of their videos, I don't even know. Because I don't, I don't like care, I like have someone else edit it for me because it's like too hard. Seriously though, thank you for watching and I'll catch you next week when I touch butts. Pfft. <laughs>